<laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you, guys. I'm, I'm really blown away by that. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you something. I ask this at conferences um, all the time. How many people here think it's better now than it was 20 years ago? Anybody? Raise your hand. Anybody? Look around. And it's always the same. Nobody, everybody knows that it sucks. I mean, it just does. It's just not getting any better, no matter what they say. So anyway, I got a gazillion slides to go through. I'm the author of 13 books and 25 films. If the United States of America is analogous to the entire universe, is planet Earth in Dallas, New York City, Tampa, Los Angeles, God forbid. <laughs> I mean, where are we? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. No one on this planet knows where our consciousness resides. Nobody. Nobody. It's not in the brain. It's not some little guy. Hi, here I am. It's not like that. No one knows where you and I reside. We're in these little biological bodies, little three-dimensional biological body suits. They work pretty well most of the time. They last, you know, 60, 70, well, I hope a little longer. I'm 72. <laughs> 80, 90 years, whatever, and then they just, you know, they begin to break down and we, we go home. It's the, whole, the whole planet runs on the Darwinian theory, which is a theory. That's all it is. No one can prove it. In fact, the neo-Darwinists, and we'll get into this tomorrow, but the neo-Darwinists are looking out there. They're looking, they realize that something had to kickstart this whole thing, and because the complexity of the DNA just didn't happen by itself. So the neo-Darwinists are looking out there, and they're kind of going like, well, maybe we were seated here. And we'll talk about that in depth. But we know that the creation of Adam happens, and I believe it, it just, it wasn't this slow process. It was just bam, and there was Adam. And the question is, what did Adam know? Was there like a download? Did he just, did he just come into being and could talk and think? And I don't know. We're not, we're not given that information. What we do know is, this is where Gary Stearman calls it the dragon trap. Who shows up? Who shows up in the garden? Rhetorical question, but the dragon shows up. Satan shows up. The devil shows up. And here's the deal, and it drives me nuts with the Bible sometimes because you just say, can we have another paragraph? Please, just maybe another line explaining this. <laughs> you don't get it. He just gives us just enough, and then it's like, oh, you have to wait. And so we wait. But the fall of man happens. Something, something happens, and we know that Eve is talking with the serpent. But the bottom line is Eve is conversing with the serpent, and we don't know how long it is. Is it a year? Is it a day? Is it 10 years? Is it 100 years? She's not alarmed. Oh, I'm just, hey, Adam, I'm going to go and talk to the serpent. I'll be back for dinner. It's like, and where is Adam? Why isn't Adam watching over this thing? We're not given, he, he's not there. But she, he, Eve is not alarmed in talking to the serpent. And that makes me immediately kind of go, because that's who I am. It's like, how many of the other animals talked? You know, we don't know. It's one of those places, I, can I have a line or two? Can I have a paragraph with a giraffe talking? And I don't know. We don't know. And this is why the skeptic and the person who's non-spiritual, not filled with the Holy Ghost, doesn't understand the Bible, looks at that and goes, that's ridiculous. Talking serpents, see, the Bible is just a bunch of nonsense. No, it's not. I believe in the literal translation, that serpent conversed with Eve. Eve is led step by step by step by step by step until she goes, yeah, that, that sounds like a good thing. Let me take a bite of this baby. And then she brings Adam over and the rest is history. So the fall of man happens. What happens next is the most, in my opinion, Genesis 3.15 is the most important scripture in the Bible. Now that's just L.A. Marzulli's take on it, but it is. Because if we understand Genesis 3.15 and we understand what's going on there, the rest of the Bible opens up. If we don't understand Genesis 3.15, it's like, do not pass go, do not pass go, do not pass go. You never get there. Because point being is when you get to Genesis 6, it's like, eh, I'm not so sure what that is. 
or you get to Abraham and the five kings, or Sodom and Gomorrah, or the conquest of Canaan. It's like, eh, and we'll get into that. That's what we're talking about tonight. This is the primer. This is to set everything up for the deep dive on Saturday about the UFO phenomenon. Because it's no longer tinfoil hat stuff. It's no longer what L.A. Marzulli's been flailing his arms wildly, gesticulating for, you know, 30 years or whatever. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. They're now here. Congress is talking about it this week. And it's hysterical, and I'll get into that more than likely tomorrow. But the bottom line is, Genesis 3.15, what does it say? You've got the little vignette. You've got the pre-incarnate Jesus who was there in the garden. That is Jesus talking about himself, which is bizarre in itself. Adam and Eve over here. And by the way, something happens. Something happens when they partake of the apple, where they fall. And I believe, total conjecture, they take on the persona, the DNA of the dragon, of the serpent. They lie. They do stuff that's wacky. The whole thing goes south real quick. But Jesus is there. So you got the dragon over here, Jesus in the middle, Adam and Eve over there. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. You will crush your head, you will strike his heel. King James, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. The message, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. Revised standard. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike her head, you will strike her. So you can take any translation. Seed war. Seed war. Seed war. Seed war. Seed war. Once we understand that and embrace it, that the offspring of the dragon will be at war and enmity with the offspring of the woman, the rest of the Bible comes alive. Everything makes sense. It's like, oh my gosh, now I get it. It's a seed war. Guess what? The seed war is erupting, is manifesting in modernity, in the present day. It's happening. It's happening. It'll be like the days of Noah when I return. But if we don't understand Genesis 3.15, when we get to the days of Noah, we have no idea what he's talking about. Either we embrace the seed war, or we just turn the page and pretend it's not there and forget about it. The offspring. Who is the son of perdition? The son of perdition. The son of perdition. Rosemary's baby had it right. The Antichrist is the seed of the dragon, in my opinion. Is he walking around? Very possibly. I don't know. Could be. Why not now? Look at where we are. Look at all the signs that are manifesting. We are in tumultuous, unprecedented time. Genesis 3.15 is the key that unlocks the door to the rest of the Bible. Because when we get to... Nephilim 101, Genesis 6, when men began to increase on number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God, the sons of God, the sons of God, saw the daughters of men were beautiful. The, the antithesis to this is that the sons of God are somehow the godly line of Seth and the daughters of men, right, are the hoochie mamas of Cain. <laughs> but I don't see hoochie mama there. <laughs> so something is drastically wrong with this picture. The sons of God will get into this, B'nai Elohim. So it's always, it always, always, always refers to the angelic host. And they married any of them they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God went into the daughters of men and had children by them. My, my last book is Counter Move, How the Nephilim Returned After the Flood. And I'll get into that. And it has to do with this book of Enoch, which is not part of our canon. Jude quotes it. It's hysterical how people will, well, it's really not part of our canon, but, you know, Jude, they all knew about the book of Enoch. If you were going to take, this is my opinion, this is Ellie Marzulli's opinion. If you were going to take one book out of the Bible and make sure people didn't read Enoch 1, that's the book you take out because it shows exactly what's going on. Let me read it to you. And you tell me, it's almost word to word what we get in Genesis 6. And it came to pass when the children of men multiplied that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. Go back here. When men began to increase in number on the earth and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful. It's almost, it's almost exactly alike. The verbiage, is, the verbiage is almost identical. And the angels, this is where it differs, 
And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget us children. And Semyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not, I indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. What thing? To take wives. Why are they doing this? The seed of the dragon will be at war with the seed of the woman. What is the dragon afraid of? What does Jesus say? That from the seed of the woman, from the offspring of the woman, what will come? The one who will crush the dragon's head. Who is that one? It's to Proto-Evangelium. It's the first prophecy in our Bible. The first prophecy in our Bible. That from the seed of the woman, someone is going to come that will crush the dragon's head. Take his kingdom away from him. So if you're a dragon, what are you going to do? You're going to go, oh, okay, I game over, I quit, you're right, I, I lose. No, 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 no. You're going to do everything you can to do what? Pollute the genome which is exactly what happens in Genesis 6. But if you don't embrace Genesis 3.15, if you just go, well, you know, Marzulia, you know, you'll never get there. Because when you get to Genesis 6, then you've got to have a reason for it. You've got to have some sort of an explanation. And you certainly can't read the book of Enoch. Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual implications not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. They all swear together and bound themselves by mutual implications on Mount Hermon. 200 watcher angels descend on Mount Hermon. We are going there for the Nephilim Mounds tour in Israel. It's sold out, but it's in October. And I lecture on Mount Hermon, and I go, here's the place. Right here, they actually found the stele with the whole thing inscribed. It's now in the British Museum. This is the area, and guess what? And this is, this, I gotta stay a couple of minutes here. I read this when I first became a Christian. So I became a Christian in 1980. So I got this book by Dr. I.D.E. Thomas in 1989. So it's about nine years later. And I'm reading this, and, and Dr. Thomas is opening up the book of Enoch, which I had never read before. And all of a sudden, the dominoes are you know, falling. Things are coming into place. But I look at Semyaza, and I go, I know that name. I know that name. And I go to my library, which burned in the fire. <laughs> and, and I pull down Edward Billy Mayer, UFO contact from the Pleiades. Every Billy Meyer was, was contacted by a so-called Pleiadian cosmonaut, nonsense. <clears throat> guess, what the, guess what the Pleiadian cosmonaut's name was? Semyaza. And I remember showing that to Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, the Book of Enoch, and then Every Billy Meyer's book, and he dropped the books and just stared at me with his mouth open. Is there a connection between Semyaza that we read about in the Book of Enoch thousands and thousands of years ago and what's appearing to this guy who's like really big in the whole UFO circle, who basically does not like Christianity at all, and I'm really being kind when I say that. Hates it. Is it the same entity? We don't know. Because you can't sit down with the entity and go, excuse me, are you the same Semyaza that we read about in the Book of Enoch? Do you have any identification we can look at? It's not going to happen. So I'm in my bed, and I'm going to sleep one night. I do not believe that Noah and his sons and his sons' wives got on the ark, and one of them had Nephilim blood in them. One of them had some kind of contamination in their DNA. I just don't believe that. But what do I do? And this is what the Holy Spirit begins with me. And I just love when he starts talking like this. He goes, what happened at the end of World War II? And I'm like... What does this have to do with, with the Nephilim, you know? And I go, I don't know. What happened at the end of World War II? There's a pause, and the Holy Spirit goes, what did the Japanese do when they realized that all was lost and they were going to lose the war? What did the Japanese do? I don't know. He goes, suicide mission. I go, oh, yeah, the suicide bombers. Yeah. And then the Holy Spirit goes, now go to the Book of Enoch. Read this. Semyaza, who was their leader, said, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall bear the penalty of a great sin. They know what they're going to do, and they do it anyway. 
Let me ask you something. When Jesus dies, where does he go? Where does he go? And what does he say when he gets down there? Read Bollinger, it's a proclamation. He goes down to the, to the angels, the fallen ones, in the dark dungeons of Tartarus, and he proclaims, no jailbreak, you're not getting out, I got the keys right here, checkmate, it's over. The cross changes everything, and then the dragon changes his whole deal, because he just lost. And he knows he's just lost, but he's not gonna give up. And so he changes the paradigm to what follows from the cross to modernity. And this is where we are now. We're in the, in the change. But the book of Enoch, and it shows us exactly who Semyaza was, their leader, the suicide pact on Mount Hermon. They knew what, what the penalty was for having sex with the women, and it's wives, it's multiple. Only eight people get aboard the ark. What does the Lord say? But Noah, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives, that's a vetting process. God's not going to say, you know, whoop, not Ham's wife, she's carrying an Ephraim gene. Noah would have known something. He's not stupid. And why would the Lord allow that? So I don't believe that for a second. There's a second and third and fourth convergence of the fallen angels on the planet. Why? Because it's all about the seed. It's all about the seed. The offspring of the dragon will be at enmity with the offspring of the woman. If they can somehow contaminate the, gene, the genome so that the Messiah is not born, it's over. And they almost succeed except for eight people. You say, well, you know, how many people were on the earth in the days of Noah? Not eight billion, that's for sure. Not eight billion. So this is, this is why the Genesis 3.15 narrative is the key. Because when we look at scriptures like this, we see that it's a seed war. We see that something is going on. Oh, and by the way, before I understood this, I used to think that the God of the Old Testament was maniacal, capricious, hateful, vengeful, lustful, favoring one tribe over another. I didn't understand it. You know, why is he flooding the... This, I'm a brand new Christian. This is 43 years ago. I'm reading the Bible for the first time in my life. I'm a spirit filled. And I get to the part of Noah and the flood, I kind of knew about it. You know, I, I grew up Catholic, so I knew the story. But I'm reading this thing and going, wait a minute. Why is he going to flood the whole earth and wipe everybody out? Come on. I'm like really ticked off. And then, and then when I get to Sodom and Gomorrah, I mean this, and I mean no disrespect to the Lord, I almost take the Bible and wing it across the room. I, this is, I, I can't worship this guy. He's maniacal. He's capricious. He's murderous and that's who a lot of you know Richard Dawkins that's what he thinks Richard Dawkins is the premier evolutionist of the 21st century right that's who he cites the God of the Old Testament because he doesn't understand the Nephilim unless we understand the seed war when we get to the flood of Noah we're left clueless why is he doing this because everything is contaminated with Nephilim DNA or fallen angel DNA including the animals how do we know this because we know in the book of Enoch this is why you keep that book out don't read the book of Enoch you'll go to hell so <laughs> seriously Ask Bob, he's there right now. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good one. Holy Spirit humor, nothing is, nothing is scripted, it's all, anyway, I digress. So, thank you, Lord. I mean, we know from Greek mythos, the centaur, the minotaur, the fauns. So the bottom line is this, if we don't understand the Genesis 3.15 narrative, the book of Enoch tells us that the fallen angels also sinned against the animal kingdom. They began to create chimeras. Well, that's impossible, all right? Oh, really? What do you think they're doing now? What does Jesus warn us? Be like the days of Noah. Doesn't he say that? What differentiates the days of Noah? Well, the fallen angels are mixing around with the seed of, of men. They're creating hybrids, known as Nephilim, but they're also messing with the genome of the animal kingdom. This is where we get the Greek mythos of of all the chimeras, it's real, it's there. And we're getting reports, they're few and far between, of people encountering chimeras. Centaurs, minotaurs, dogmen. Right here, right now. As in the days of Noah, so will be at the coming of the Son of Man. We're here, this is what's happening. And I'll show you this slide a little bit later, but it talks about, you know, they, now they can take different genetic material and spice it, can't they? And we're always assured, well, they destroyed all the embryos. <laughs> Nonsense. Do you really expect me to believe that? Just, just like, I, can I say this? Just like, you know, COVID came from the wet market, right? Yeah. 
And if you believe that, okay, I've been on this slide long enough. We'll never get out of here. Jude says this, and the angels who did not keep their position of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. Now he's going back to Enoch. These he has kept in darkness. Peter tells us exactly what they were. Bound with everlasting change for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, now he's linking what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah to what? The angels who, leave, who left their first estate and did what? Sodom and Gomorrah and surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. I believe, it's this, I believe there's a, a linguistic tie there between when the fallen angels come down and they're doing the same thing. There's your second incursion. Every place where the Nephilim shows up in the biblical prophetic narrative, the judgment is always the same. There is never any forgiveness because you're irredeemable, because you're not human. You're not human anymore. You cease to have a soul. You've taken on the DNA, the persona of the dragon's kingdom. What is the mark of the beast? Why is it that anyone who takes the mark winds up in the lake of fire? Where's the grace and mercy? Why can't you reverse it? Why can't you reverse it? Surely you can reverse it. Surely you can repent if you take the mark. No, you can't. Because it changes your DNA and you take on the persona. You become a modern day Nephilim is what you become. And that's why you wind up in the lake of fire. And I realize, that's unbelievable. It's all in the Bible. If we, under, if we understand Genesis 3.15, then when we get to the passage is like the book of Revelation where it talks about what happens to the people who take the mark, it all goes like this. It all goes like this. Because the only time throughout the biblical prophetic narrative where we see this kind of judgment is when Father God deals with the Nephilim, deals with the offspring of the dragon. Because you're not human anymore. Why is it that when we get translated from these bodies and we wind up in his presence and our sin nature is gone, how does that work? So I had this vision where the Lord actually took me up. I've only had two in 43 years. As Paul would say, in the body or out of the body, I don't know. This was for three seconds. Three seconds. I'm getting ready to go in the shower. All of a sudden, I'm translated. I'm not, I'm not in the bathroom anymore. I'm in this heavenly scene. As far as I can see, there's a throng of people. We're not pressed together like this. There's a space between some of us. Others are closer together. We're all facing the same direction. There's a holy reverential silence that permeates the entire scene. Holy, everybody knows exactly what's happened, exactly where we are. Holy reverential silence. And I go like this. My sin nature's gone. I go, I look down at my solar plexus. Why? I don't know. It was gone. My sin nature was gone. It was not there. And I knew it. And I knew it was gone. I, was, I no longer had to deal with the dragging the goofy old man around. It's gone. How does that work? What lever does he push? What magic button does he hit? I don't know. Be healed. And boom, we're all healed in his presence at the rapture. The trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Right? Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Harpazo. That's where we get the rapture from. Caught up. Caught up. Caught up. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together with those in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we'll, forevermore we'll be with him. It's not fantasy. It's not some invention by Darby 150 years ago. It's in our Bibles. It's like right there. It's our blessed hope. He's coming back for his church. He's coming back for us. We're not appointed to wrath. We're not appointed to the tribulation. So, what are we? Spirit, soul, and body. When we become born again and spirit-filled, our spirit becomes filled with the Holy Spirit, and for the first time in our lives, it becomes enacted. It becomes alive. Until that moment, we're dead in our spirit. And what, what is our soul? Our emotions? The, our DNA, which gives us you know, one guy can be a great basketball player, somebody else is a potter, somebody else, the gifting that God gives each person, our personalities, that's all in our soul, and the body, of course, is this. So when we die, our spirit, if we're born again, our spirit and soul are with the Lord. The body, in the ground, 
And what happens at that last trumpet? The dead in Christ will rise first. That's that body coming up and we are finally in a glorified body. How does that work? I have no idea. It's a mystery. But I believe it literally, when, when that trumpet sounds, there's a song that uh, Johnny Cash did, you know, uh, at that trumpet sound, if, if, if the dead come out of the ground, I'll be walking too. And that's exactly what it is. You know, if you come out of the ground, I'll be, I'll be walking with you. You know, if, if, I, if I pass away, I know the dead in Christ will rise first. I mean, what a, it's, the stuff we believe is so wacky, it's beyond science fiction. I mean, it is. And yet we know it's real because of the spirit of a living God. That's within us. But anyway, I digress. So what we see is all these different Nephilim tribes, like the Anakim, Anakim Skywalker. Anakim means long necks. The Zanzumim means the buzzing ones. I mean, it's, it's all there. And it seems to me, and this is conjecture, that the dragon, Satan, is messing with the genome, constantly messing with it, trying to find some mixture to create a human being in his, in his own likeness. He can't do it, which is why sometimes you get giants, sometimes long necks, sometimes buzzing ones. There seems to be, the names seem to denote certain genetic characteristics in each of the tribes. But the mandate's the same for all the tribes. If this is going on, and they're here, you're going to go wipe them all out because they're not human. And of course, when, we, when Joshua goes in, they all freak out because they know this is the hand of God. They don't stand a chance. And so what we get is we get a diaspora of giants. We get a diaspora from the Levant, from the Promised Land. We get a fleeing of the tribes. That's con it's not conjecture, and I'll get to that. This recently was a lead tablet we're going there on Mount Ebal in Israel. So Joshua just conquers the city of Ai. The giants are in Ai. Look it up yourself. The Nephilim are in Ai. And he goes up to Mount Ebal and he constructs an altar. Now I admit I am completely biased, completely biased in the translation. But this is what the translation says from this lead tablet that they opened up and they were able to read the transcription. And when they read it, it rewrites history because they realized that Yahweh is written there and this thing is over 3,000 years old. So they have written in a lead tablet the name Yahweh, which is, which is unprecedented. And it says, cursed, 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 cursed of Yahweh. You are cursed, you will die cursed, 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 that was it. Cursed, 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 you will die cursed, cursed of Yahweh, cursed, cursed, cursed. Now, when we read in our Bibles the blessings and the cursings, I get that. But it says, if you do this, you'll be blessed. If you do this, you'll be cursed. That's not what this is. And Mount Ebal is on the gateway to the Promised Land. So I look, and I've talked to the archaeologists about this, and they've said, yes, that's a possible interpretation, but we don't know. Is it possible that this inscription is not to the Israelites, but it's to the inhabitants of the land? Cursed, 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 cursed of Yahweh. You will die cursed, 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 cursed. I mean, that is so, and I've talked to rabbis about this in Jerusalem. It is so severe, I can't imagine anybody in their right mind speaking this over their family. I mean, it's just like, eh, eh. but where, where Mount Ebal is, the gateway to the promised land, and it's on the altar of Joshua, who he builds this right after the conquest of Ai, where the Nephilim tribes are, it makes perfect sense to me. I'm biased, completely biased. So you have to do your own research and wait to see what the so-called experts say. A Nephilim, the Nephilim on the earth for those days and also afterward. This is the enigmatic Chongo skull. And let's get this right out of the way. So we are told that this is the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. Let me point out a couple of things. The orbits are 25 to 30 percent larger than a human being. This is one of the largest skulls, the zygomatic arch, which is right here. Very heavy, very pronounced. Human beings don't have that. The jaw is robust, but there's the kicker, and I'll get to the kicker in a little bit. The bottom line is this, this is not the result of cranial deformation. 
Cranial deformation or cranial headboarding is when you take the head of an infant and you put boards and you bind the head and you leave that there for like two years and you will make a cone head. We're not disputing that. But what we're saying is you cannot enlarge, you can't make the, the orbits 25 to 30% larger and the pupillary distance, according to our optometrist, instead of 65 millimeters, it's about 45 millimeters, which means that these entities might have had night vision, according to him. And we'll get into that in just a little bit and why that's important. So what we see here, there's a side view of it. Notice this is a zygomatic arch right here. Look how pronounced that is. We don't have those features. We believe this is a genetic aberration. When men began to increase in number, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. This is it, Genesis 3.15. So what I'm showing you, and I'll, and I'll get to the DNA evidence in a little bit, is that something is going on, that this genetic tampering, there are vestiges of it all over the planet. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. But it's hidden away. It's deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. The powers that be take the information and, and hide it, and I can tell you story after story after story. So let's go here. So we are told by mainstream archaeologists, this is Cusco, Peru. It's the place called Saxebaman. I've been there, I think, four or five times. Okay, let's stop here. This is Ron Moorhead. He's six feet tall. I want you to look at the wall. There's not one stone here that's exactly alike. Each one is different. This stone here might be upwards of 60 tons. The quarry for these stones is about 40 miles away downhill, number one. Number two, this is andesite stone. Andesite stone is number seven on the Mohs hardness scale, a diamond being number 10. Diamond's real hard. So andesite is really hard. So back in the Neolithic, the Inca only had these copper chisels. So we show in the film that's about to be released soon, out of place artifacts, this guy in, I think it's Norway, has a copper chisel, brand new copper chisel, it's all sharp, a block of andesite stone. He takes the chisel, puts it on the andesite, hits it six or seven times, and then holds the chisel up. It's completely dull, flattened. So here's the deal. If you can't cut andesite stone in the Neolithic with a copper chisel, then you can't cut andesite stone. Then the Inca didn't build it, and the whole thing falls apart. See up here? This is what I lovingly refer to as Inca slop. <laughs> Those are head-sized boulders, which a normal six-foot man can, can move. Look up there. Look at this guy. No cranes, no diamond saws. How's it done? And the archaeologists, and I've been there, it's hysterical. The docents who are, they're just parroting what they learned. The Inca were master stone builders. No, they weren't. Stop lying to us. You have no idea who built this thing. You're just making it up as you go along. Look at this. Look, I mean, look, just, just look at this. When we're here, when I lead tours to Peru, and I show them this, and I go, touch the wall. Reach out and touch the wall. You are touching the fingerprints of the supernatural. Because we can't do this in modernity. With cranes and diamond saws and lasers, at what cost? Could we do it? Possibly now. But cranes, diamond saws, lasers? Well, you are looking at a technology, I call it fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture, because that's what it is. And it's ancient. It's absolutely ancient. So look at this. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. And why? How many people here work with wood? Anybody, any of you guys are woodworkers? Okay. You know that to do this, this little curve like right here, can you do it with a, with a jigsaw and a, or a belt sanders and all this stuff, modern day equipment? Yeah. But this is out of andesite stone. And look at this. You go down and then you just, oh, what the heck, we'll make a little, little curve there. That's because we can do it. I mean, seriously, it's playful in some ways. And they're not sweating it. They can do it. And whoever did this took the tools with them. So this is what we're up against now, okay? The other side of the aisle, the New Agers, look at this and go, oh, this is proof of extraterrestrial intervention. 
This is what, you got to really listen, come close, because this is what your kids are listening to. This is what we are being told for the last 12 years or whatever it is on ancient aliens, that ancient astronauts did this. Okay, you can believe that if you want, but instead of saying ancient astronauts, why not just call them fallen angels? Because that's what this is, in my opinion. Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. This is going back to when we read about the Tower of Babel. They built with brick instead of stone because the angelic hosts weren't there at Babel. And the whole point of the Tower of Babel is to open the gateway, open the portal, and get these bad boys back in. And God says, no, I'm not doing that. We're going to confuse. You're going to speak Chinese over here, Swahili over there, really bad English over in this section, but it's okay. And that's it. I mean, when you look at that, it's, it's, it's just mind-boggling. There's another shot of it. That's Irene, our, one of our guides. And, and look at the size of this thing. I mean, all they have is llamas. <laughs> yep, we're gonna, we're gonna take these 10,000 llamas, we're making ourselves a wagon train of llamas. <laughs> we're gonna take these stones 45 miles away, we're gonna drive those llamas up and just, I mean, come on! And, and yet the guy sit there and go, the Inca, we're master stone builders, he just wanna scream, just wanna scream. Calm down, LA. So here's a perfect example of Inca slop, right, over the original stone casing. That's the original, and then the Inca come in and they do this. Yeah, we'll just add these stones. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just laughable. Look at this. This is in a place called Waitara. Look, this is the ancient, and then above it is, is the Inca, and then above that is the colonial. So you have three different types of building here. Inca slop, it's kind of hard to see because they've stuck it over it, and then the colonial. But that's the original. Now, not every stone here is different, and then you get these trapezoidal shapes. We think it's some sort of a machine. It's very, very deliberate. It's got piezoelectric properties, but all of this was destroyed. All of it was destroyed in some sort of an ancient cataclysm. So look at this. This is called the gateway to the sacred valley. Are there two different builders here? Or did this crew just decide after lunch, ah, I'm not doing this anymore, let's just get their head size going. <laughs> I mean, what did they? <laughs> and there's, <laughs> there's the Sacred Valley right there. So it's obviously two different, this is Inca Slop right here. I mean, I'd love to have a wall like that in my house. I'm not bagging the, they're great stone builders. But don't tell me that this is the same. I'm not stupid. Don't try to tell me that for some reason the Inca said, well, we're not going to, it's just too costly, we can't afford it anymore. Nonsense. They have no idea how to build it. And this stone comes from a quarry miles away. This stuff here is indigenous. You can reach down and pick it up. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. And the way to solve it is understand Genesis 3.15, that there's a seed war, and the Nephilim are walking amongst us, and fallen angel technology, and the vestiges of it are everywhere, are absolutely everywhere. And that should blow your mind, because most people don't know this, because it's not in the history books, and it's deliberately kept from the people. Deliberately kept from the people. So, this is a place called Oye Tintambo. It's in the Sacred Valley. So look at this. What's this? Why well, wake up on a Monday morning? This is andesite once again. Look at that. How do you do that? How do you do this? And why? It's part of a machine, I think. It's some sort of a machine. We don't know what it was or how it worked, but there it is. And this is thrown down from a sacred temple. They call everything's the temple of the sun or the temple of the moon, which is just, they just invent stuff. So look at the, look at, if you, you got to look really carefully. And you can see the auger, you can actually see it going down through the stone. It's kind of hard to see, but there's actually rings where the, where the drill is going into the stone. The Inca don't have anything like this. They had drills, hand drills, but nothing where you could see the actual ring. This thing is going through the stone like butter, whatever did it. Then we've got the trapezoidal shapes. Then we've got the retaining wall. So here, this is on the side of the mountain, this is where a temple was, and we see the absolute precision. This is called ashlar construction. There's no mortar that sets any of these stones. 
they fit one on top of each other perfectly. How is that done? How is it done? And this is what, what it, it just drives me nuts is when the tour guys try to tell us that this was done by the Inca. Show us. Show me how you get this size stone up on the mountain. And then, then how you cut the stone so it fits absolutely perfectly. How do you cut it? And you can see that it's not dressed, the face isn't just dressed like this. The whole stone is. Everything fits together absolutely perfectly. And then we get this. <laughs> Again, you, you work, woodworkers, I'll give you three, three pine blocks. Three pine blocks. One, two, three. Just make this. Can you do it today? Jigsaws, band saws. You know, you make your template. You, I could do it. I'm a woodworker. I could do it. It would take a lot of effort to do it with pine. But this is andesite stone. And, and these blocks weigh, some of them, 10, 20 tons. They do it because they can do it because the technology that did this is no longer on this planet. And this is all that's left of a so-called temple of the sun. What's interesting here, there's some really very enigmatic signatures. Look at this. It's like a stairway in both directions. There was a place at Sac Sabaman where the rock had come apart, and in that was a staircase where you could walk down but then as you looked overhead, there was another staircase. Why did they do that? Why are there two different staircases? One on the ceiling and one for my feet. Why would they do that? And they were not, a six foot man on six feet could not, I'd have to hunch down like this. So now it gets really weird and they have no answer to that. So we look at also this, whoever did this knew about the earthquakes and what these plinths are here that it relieved the pressure in the stones. So when an earthquake happens, the stones won't fall down. And to give you an idea how old it is, that's what it looked like about 120 years ago. And when you're there, it's, the quarry is about a mile away where they got most of the stone. And this is up here. You gotta go across the valley like this and then up to where the quarry is. It's a mile away. So how did they move the stones? No cranes, no horses. They've got llamas. It's not going to work. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. Here's a great shot. That's Brian Forrester. I'm looking out at the Sacred Valley, which is there. This is all hidden away. It's amazing. And you see that something very cataclysmic happened here. Something threw down all these stones and broke them. And I believe that these sites were connected. The sites were connected. And you say, LA, come on now. I mean, you're, I get the Genesis 315 thing, but you're, you're losing me here. Okay. America Stonehenge is a 4,000 year old site. It's in New Hampshire. Okay, so now I'm not in some faraway place like Peru. I'm in New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Well, you have smart people doing smart things. <laughs> in New Hampshire. This is called the Bow Stone. America Stonehenge is about 120 acres. It's a 4,000 year old site. It's really not a henge like Stonehenge. But what it is, it's got a sacrificial table, and I'll get to that. It's got a center in that in that circle, in where all these, and they didn't, when they bought the property, when Robert Stone bought the property decades ago, they knew something was up, but they didn't know what. They didn't, weren't sure, but they knew that something, it looks like there's solar alignments because there was this standing stone that they found, like this, with a point on it, and they saw the summer solstice sunrise coming up, and they went, that's really cool. So they realized that the whole thing, they found other uh, standing stones all the way around the property and they begin to go wow this is like this is the winter solstice and the summer solstice and the equinoxes and this is the 28 day stone and this is unbelievable so there was a collapse a collapsed chamber on the site a collapsed chamber and 
an archaeologist is digging about a foot down, and he finds this stone. And they realize that there's writing on the stone, but they don't know what the writing says. It lays in the museum there for 11 years. Professor Barry Fell gets wind of the stone. This is New Hampshire now gets wind of the stone in the writing, and he travels. He was a professor at Harvard University. So he comes out and he looks at this and he goes, I think that's Iberian Punic, and I think I can translate it. So I'm walking through the museum with Kelsey Stone, who's the grandson of Robert. So it's Robert, Dennis, and Kelsey. I got my little Osmo camera. I'm doing B-roll. And I'm going, what's this? He goes, oh, these are the, uh, these are the stones with inscriptions on them. I go, oh, that's pretty cool. What's this one say? He goes, oh, that's, uh, that's our dedication stone. I go, oh, really? What do you mean? He goes, this says to Baal of the Canaanites in dedication in Iberian Punic in New Hampshire. To Baal of the Canaanites in dedication. What is that doing in New Hampshire? And it's not a hoax. Because, you know, let me get this straight, yeah, the hoaxer is going to know Iberian Punic and then go ding, 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 bury it in a in collapsed chamber so it can sit in the museum for 11 years until just by luck, Barry Fell gets wind of it and he comes in, or the forge is making lots of money off this nonsense. But the archaeologists refuse to look at it because that completely rewrites history. Because you can't have Canaanites here 4,000 years ago. That doesn't work. Ah, sorry. When he says to bow the Canaanites, I flip out. It's in the film, America Stonehenge. It's number four in the series. I totally flip out. I go, what did you say? This is my wheelhouse. They know nothing about the Nephilim. They know nothing. Canaanites, bow. This is, this is Nephilim Central. I'm going like, oh my gosh, to bow the Canaanites in dedication in New Hampshire. If that doesn't blow your mind, wait till, wait, wait till what I'm about to show you. Because this is the greatest archaeological discovery of the 21st century. Here's the sacrificial table. When they bought the property, they didn't even know this thing was there. This was all filled with dirt. They saw this, and they began to dig down. And right underneath here, we're trying to get samples of the roof, because underneath is a hidden chamber, and it never gets wet. So there's some sort of clay or whatever that they use above here to keep the, the chamber dry. It's an oracle chamber. So someone would sit here while they're sacrificing Uncle Ted here on the table, and the ritual would begin. How do I know that? Because I see this on the island of Malta at the Hypogeum, almost exactly the same thing, oracle chambers. I see it in Sardinia, the Tomb of the Giants, almost the same thing, oracle chamber. Same guys coming across from the Levant, from the di diaspora of the giants, and the conquest of Canaan, and spreading westward and winding up here. To bow of the Canaanites in dedication. That's the sacrificial table. Take a look at this. See this right here? The whole table is canted down. So the blood of a human being is collected right here. Human sacrifice. It's always about the blood. It's moving right along. So it, they discovered this. They knew about you can see the equinox sunrise here. You can see all these different, these are standing stones all the way around the center of the site. And they knew that whoever did this knew about, you know, north and south and the winter solstices and summer solstices. Okay, that in itself is, is kind of mind boggling. So Kelsey Stone is a 23 year old college student and he's grown up at the site America Stonehenge. His grandfather is Robert Stone who bought the site. Dennis is his father. He grew up sleeping on the sacrificial table. Kelsey, you lost your mind? So he goes on Google Earth and he goes, I wonder how close from the equinox sunrise right here, okay? Or the solstice, it's actually the summer solstice. Where's the solstice if I can find it? There's the winter solstice. Anyway, so he goes on, he goes on Google Earth and he draws a line from the center of his site right there, and you can see the white line. And it goes out to the summer solstice standing stone. So there's the center of, Kel's, of the site, and he draws the line like this. You see these spirals? This is where they cleared the areas so they could sit in the center and look at those standing stones. Because when they bought it, it was all overgrown. 
So you go back 4,000 years ago, this is on a high place, and it was all meadow 4,000 years ago. They've had soil testing. 4,000 years, it's all meadow. So you could see when they placed the standing stones, you would be able to see them by standing. There was no forest. So they had to do all this. So, so Kelsey is ambitious, and he, and he takes the line on Google Earth, and he extends it. He's just playing around. This kid's 23 years old, just playing around. So he finds himself through Ireland, and he extends the line, and he winds up splitting the trilithons at Stonehenge, England. This has been tested over and over and over again. You can do it yourself. In order to do this, you not only do you have to be in the air, you've got to know trigonometry, you've got to know the curvature of the Earth. 4,000 years ago, that's impossible. Who's the prince of the power of the air? And guess what? Once they got this, they went and started checking all the other stones. Chaco Canyon, Machu Picchu, Teotihuacan, Mexico, the Canary Islands, the Great Pyramid of Giza. How is it possible? How is it possible? It's the technology of the dragon. It's the technology of fallen angels. It's all connected. Every bit of it's connected. And all this was wiped out. That's why all these sites were active and alive at one point, but they're not active anymore. They're not. The dragon's changed his tune. So moving right along, there's another shot. That, that line bisects directly. I mean, just think about that. The precision. To do, I'm not making this up. You can go on Google Earth and you can do it yourself. They've checked it. I've had, I had my guy out in California check it, and he, he's going, oh my gosh, I don't put, where does he get this? Where does he get this? And I just started laughing because it blows their mind. It blew my mind when I saw it. Who is the prince of the power of the air? Who is the prince of the power of the air? It's the dragon, isn't he? There's a kingdom all around us. We see the fingerprints of the supernatural all around us. This is in New Hampshire. It's not in some faraway place like Peru. It's in New Hampshire. And the fingerprints of a dragon are right there screaming at us. I was here, I did this. There's a seed war. There's a seed war, and we'll get into that. We, Kelsey extended the line. It winds up in Beirut. Beirut is the home of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are descendants of the Canaanites. The Canaanites were an Ephraim tribe. The Phoenicians were master at seafarers, and they spread all across the sea. What's interesting is that it gives you an idea of, of the scope of this. And this is what we discovered. And we don't know what this means. There's Gilgal Raphaim, the circle of the giants. There's Baalbek. Where's Baalbek? There's Baalbek way up here. They're exactly 47 and a half miles from the line. There's Mount Hermon, where all the mischief happened. We're not sure what we're looking at. We know it's significant, but we don't understand the significance of it. We don't. If any of you out there can figure this out, great. But there's Gilgal Raphaim, 47 and a half miles. There's Baalbek, two ancient megalithic sites. So Gilgal Raphaim, which we also visit when we go, this is my drone footage, the circle of the giants, 42,000 tons of basalt rock heaped together in five concentric rings. In the middle is a tomb. We crawled down on the tomb. We filmed in there. This is all in our, our On the Trail of the Nephilim series. And the reason why I'm doing this, bringing this, is we say, well, I thought we were going to hear about UFOs. If I don't do the backstory, when I leap into the UFO phenomenon, you're going to go, I don't get it. But if I do the backstory, then you're going to see that these are the fingerprints of the dragon. And that just gives you an idea. So that's Gilgal, Gilgal Raphaim. We will go there in October on our tour. 42,000 tons of basalt rock. So who does this? And the tomb is bizarre. The tomb is really bizarre. You get down into that thing, and once again, it's, it's ritualistic. And you would, you, if you were a young man, they'd put you in there, and you would receive the spirits of the Nephilim. Because we see this over and over and over again at sites like America's Stonehenge, at sites like the Tomb of the Giants in Sardinia, there's a chamber where the initiate goes in and, and, and gets basically demonized. This is Baalbek. This is the Stone of the Pregnant Women. 
So let me get this straight. Yeah, guys, we're going to make some really big stones, and we're going to make a temple out of them. How are we going to move the stones? Well, we don't know yet, but we'll figure that out. So this is the largest stone ever hewn until a female archaeologist, I think she was Egyptian, went, why don't we dig around the stone and see what's there? And right next to the stone are two larger stones that were quarried. Who gets up on a Monday morning and does this? Seriously. Nephilim architecture, fallen angel technology. That's what we're looking at. And there's Mount Hermon right next to the line. If we don't get Genesis 3.15 and when we find ourselves at the Tower of Babel, what do we say about Nimrod, who was a mighty man? What is a Gabor? Because Nimrod becomes what? He becomes Gaborim. How? Through ritualistic sex magic. He takes on this thing. And that's when the Lord finally interferes. What about Abraham and the five kings? What about Sodom and Gomorrah? I don't know. This is what happens on a stele on the north coast of Africa from Procopius. The account of Procopius' history of the Vandal War of ancient Punic inscriptions read, this is on the north coast of Africa. It was a rock, a stele, and this was what was inscribed. We fled here from the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. So that is proof that there's this western diaspora of the Nephilim tribes. And then we get into this. It happened here in the Americas. So there's an elongated skull on the left. There's a human skull on the right. Notice the size of the orbits. Notice the size of the skull. Notice the reddish hair. Here's a 2,000-year-old mummy skull in Peru that we unwrapped. Notice, this is 2,000 years old. We had carbon testing data, carbon dating on it. Notice the intricate of the weave and the colors still vibrant. Notice the elongation. That's Joe Taylor, who passed away about a month ago. Aaron Judkins, one of our archaeologists on the team. Took him about three hours, four hours to unwrap the mummy. And as he was unwrapping this, the hair that came off from the mummy wrappings, that's what we took. Immediately flag and bag it, tag it, put it in a plastic bag. That went right off to the DNA labs. That's what it looked like. Let's walk through it quickly. Reddish hair, look at the size of the orbits. You think that's natural? That's not natural. They're 25 to 30 percent larger pupillary distance. Something is going on here. Something is going on. And when they were discovering these things like 150, 175 years ago, we ourselves, these archaeologists, there was this debate. Oh, it's all cranial deformation. They found this mummy called the Chudi mummy. And the mummy was a female, and the female was pregnant. So they decided, let's open her up and see what the fetus looks like. So they did. And this is what the fetus looks like. Elongated skull, look at the neck. Elongated neck, and look at the teeth. Babies don't come out with teeth. Babies don't have this type of formation. And it's not hydrocephaly, where water's on the brain and it swells. It's not that. This is a genetic aberration. The mitochondrial DNA mutations unknown in human primate or animal known so far. This is the basis of our DNA testing. So I'm going to move on quickly here, if I can. Washington Herald, prehistoric giant on Earth. Seymour, Texas. Oil drillers claim to have found bones of a prehistoric giant 10 feet high. The Department of Agriculture yesterday received uh, from an agent on Tiburon Island, Gulf of California, the skeleton of a primitive man more than 10 feet tall. 15 feet tall. The skeleton of a prehistoric man of large size has been found at a town 10 miles southeast city of Mexico. And it just goes on. A doctor who was present stated that the man must have been 11 feet tall. The mound was partially covered by a pine stump 3 feet 6 inches in diameter. And the ground showed no signs of ever having been disturbed. This is in Indiana. This is where a lot of the mounds were and everything else. Check this one out. This is Calcutta. A discovery of worldwide importance is reported from the village of Pentija uh, in the whatever district where a giant human skeleton was unearthed. 31 feet, possible. I, I'm doubting that one a little bit. The bones of a giant 10 feet in height were found near Lewisport. That's 1897. My conversation with a tenure professor about the bones. She's a tenure professor at a major university, and I asked her, well, what about these medical doctors stating on the record that they uncovered the thigh bone, the femur, and they could measure the femur, and they, they know how to do the equation and the math, 
based on a 37 inch femur, you know, we're looking at a 10 footer. Oh, they didn't know how to measure. <laughs> Direct quote. What do you do with that? What do you, because if they, if they give you an inch, if they say, well, but they don't do that. If you're a first year archeological student, they say there are no giants. They didn't know how to measure. It's all a bunch of nonsense. They were just trying to sell papers and that was all, it's all a bunch of hype. But we know that they're there. This is Robert Mirabal. I'll just run a portion of this. And a long time ago, they say there were giants that roamed the land. They came from the sky, fell in love with the sons and daughters of the earth. Hear that? They had the ability to reach your mind and foresee the future. The men would go hunting in the mountains for deer or elk, while the women would prepare offerings to honor these giants. you get the idea. That's Native American oral tradition told to him by his grandfather, mirroring the Genesis 6 account almost verbatim. There were giants in the land. This is my work, my discovery on Catalina Island. There were pictures that I found in the archives. What's that? What is this? There were elongated skulls. What is that doing on Catalina Island, which is 27 miles across the ocean from Los Angeles? Look at the elongated skull. Similarity, you tell me. The seat of the the seat of the dragon will be at enmity at war with the seat of the woman. This this photograph went viral. I discovered it. So there's Ralph Glidden, who's a primitive archaeologist employed by the Hay Museum, 1919 and 1921. The Hay Museum gets gobbled up by the Smithsonian. He unearths this giant skeleton. Look at the size of the head. I had three different researchers look at the picture, digitize the picture, and this is what we came up with. So we take the original photograph, we take Ralph out, we know he was five foot eight. He was five foot eight. We take the skeleton, we stand him up, and we basically get an eight foot nine inch skeleton. We believe it was closer to nine feet, but we're being conservative by saying eight foot nine. That rewrites history. So we go back to the museum six months later, Richard Shaw and I, to film there because the, the book went viral, the photograph went viral. We walk in the museum, I go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And Rick goes, oh my gosh. And the curator is there and she's going, what, what? And I go, and I have my book with me and I go, no, 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 no. That's not the picture. That's not the picture. This is the picture. What did you guys do? Oh, well, they were scientists here. We only believe in the truth. We go where science leads us. We would never lie to the public in any way, shape, or form. We would never photograph or crop out something that would not fit our paradigm or, or our worldview because we just don't do that. We're scientists, and you can trust us and believe in us. Nonsense. Why would you do this? Why would you crop the giant out of the... So we photographed this. That went viral. And so I went back to the museum about a year later, and they had the picture, this one, up on the wall. Where is it? They had this one up on the wall. Sorry. They had this one up on the wall, blown up like this big. But nothing about what you are looking at are the bones of a nine-footer. Mm -mm. Nothing like that at all. And now it's all gone. When you go there and you say, hey, where's the Ralph Gordon display? 
because they change curators all the time. And the new curator, we checked this out recently, knows nothing about this photograph at all. My discovery went viral. Why would they do this? I'll tell you why. Because it points back to the veracity of the biblical prophetic narrative. It points back to Genesis 3.15. The seed of the dragon will be an enmity at war with the seed of the woman. Here we are. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. There's a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world, and that's why I am on the trail of the Nephilim. How many fingers do you see there? Count them. This is also from Catalina. How many fingers? One, two, three, four, five. Where's the thumb? The thumb should be there. See that? That's not a thumb. It's a six-fingered skeleton. This thing we based on the, the size of the, of the uh, bowl here. It's another nine-footer found on Catalina Island. And of course, all these things now are, are hidden away. This is how we figured it out. I got to go quickly. So look at this. This is the, what we call the Arroyo skull. And it was found in a mine, was now a mining town. Look at the very prominent zygomatic arch. And we did DNA testing on that. There's a normal human being. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. What is a six-fingered hand doing on a tapestry hanging in a museum in Peru? And I, I go to the docent and I go, excuse me, why is, uh, why is there a six-fingered hand there? And the guy goes, probably had too many Pisco sours. Oh. <laughs> That's what they might have looked like. So this is one of the DNA evidence that we did. This is really important. This is the work of our anthropologist on our team, Rick Woodward. This is a foramen magnum. Everybody in this room has one. This is where our skeleton, the spinal column, attaches to the base of the skull. This is really important. This is his work. This is a smoking gun. Because it shows us that what we're looking at is not cranial deformation. That's a foramen magnum. It should be in the center of the skull, just like it is with everybody in the room. If it's not, you have trouble balancing your head and doing this, right? In all the Paraka skulls, the foramen magnum, you can see, is pushed all the way back to the occipital plate, all the way back to the rear, the posterior of the skull. If it's any further back on some of these things, it's outside the skull. You cannot, I repeat, you cannot cradle headboard a child and move the foramen magnum. The foramen magnum here should be up in here someplace in the center of the skull. It's done in utero. When the child is still in the womb, everything is formed. This is something that's genetic. In our film, the, the DNA evidence number six in our Amitra of Nephilim series, we have archaeologists, anthropologists, surgeons, medical doctors, optometrists, chiropractors, all coming on the record stating whatever this is, it's genetic. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the dragon will be at war at enmity with the seed of the woman. You say, well, L.A., L.A., everything I'm showing you is evidence. I could submit this in a court of law and say that there's an outside agency that's deliberately, deliberately manipulating the genome. And then I can point back to the Genesis 3.15 narrative. You see the way everything starts to go like this? It all, it's, all, it's all the fingerprints of the supernatural. It's all the fingerprints of the dragon. Moving right along, the Foramen Magum. This I got to show you. This is this is the enigmatic Chongo skull, which I showed you later. So we're doing DNA samples at the Ica Museum. And I, and I asked the, the archaeologist, can we, can we just look at the Chongo skull? Can you take it out of the skull? All we want to do is have you rotate it. We wanted to see where the placement of the foramen magnum is. Watch this. really is. Oh my God, it's right in the back. Stop. That thing, if it's, if it's like a half an inch, it's outside the skull. And when I saw that, I just, you could hear my voice. I'm going, you got to, it should be in here. It should be like, it, the whole thing should be back in here. It's not. It's all the way to the occipital plate. You cannot move the foramen magnum. You can't do that. It's, it's done in utero. It's in, it's in the uterus. It's formed. You, you can't move that through cranial deformation. 
It doesn't work that way. No matter what you do. You, it just, anyway, moving right along. So we did the DNA testing, H2A, Europe. T2B, 10,000 years ago, the Fertile Crescent, Syria. Here's our friend. We did this. We did the hair testing on this guy. Three different labs. They all, no collusion between them. U2E1, Eastern Europe. Why does that rewrite history? Because the Beringian land bridge, the Darwinian paradigm, insists that the new world was populated at the end of the last ice age. Now, some of that's been changing. Now they're going like, well, they sailed down, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I get that. But no, nobody came over from Europe. Nonsense. Everybody came over from Europe. What's that DNA doing there? Oh, it's all contaminated. So did you see our protocols? Head to toe lab suits, hair masks, face masks, goggles, double sleeves, double gloves, boots. And every time we went in and got a new skull and, and took DNA from it, we would then go outside the room get rid of the lab suits, put on new lab suits, and go back in, and spray each other with compressed air. Our protocols were above board, especially for field extraction. And we would take a Dremel tool, turn the skull over, and where the foramen magnum was, we would drill into that. We would take compressed air and blow the initial stuff off of it, get fresh material, fresh genetic material, it would fall down like this, put it in the paper, we have got gloves on, hand it to Chase Cossie, tagged him back, put in the plastic bag. You can't do it any better than that. Fresh genetic material, and this is what we get. We get this. This rewrites history. It rewrites history as we know it. It's U2E1. It's an elongated skull. And what the heck is it doing in Peru? It shouldn't be there. U2E1 is Eastern Europe. Oh, it's all contaminated. Well, why don't you go down and take the same samples and then get back to us when you do it. Oh no, we can't do that, that's too much work and nobody, no one has proved this wrong. It's a straw man argument. Oh, it's all contaminated, straw man, straw man. Why, because you say so? Did you look at our protocols? That machine doesn't care what I believe. It doesn't care and if, we, if it was contaminated, you'd find nuclear DNA, you'd find my DNA. Not the case, didn't find it. So moving right along and we're almost done. Why is this important? because all of this rewrites history. And it points back to the veracity and the validity of the biblical prophetic narrative is what it does. It shows us from everything I've showed you tonight that what happened in antiquity is, is being mirrored in modernity. What happened thousands of years ago is repeating itself, although slightly different in modernity. And this is what we'll talk about tomorrow. Are we in the days that are like to Noah? Absolutely, we're here all day long. Jesus warns us in Matthew 24, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. He just assumes that we all know what happened in the days of Noah. If you don't know Genesis 3.15, and you don't, we don't understand, if we don't understand, if we don't know Genesis 3.15, when we get to Genesis 6 in the days of Noah, we have no idea what Jesus is talking about. I don't know, the days of Noah, well, they were eating and drinking. Well, that's been going on for thousands of years. So that's not it. And who are they in the Genesis 6 narrative? It's the sons of God. They're the ones. See what I mean? Who are they? They were eating and drinking. Who were they? Read the Genesis 6 account. Genesis 3.15, if we don't embrace it, if we don't understand what it is, when we get to this, well, I don't know, it's, yeah, okay. Be like a days of Noah, yeah, I don't have to worry about that. My mortgage is coming up. And so most of us never think about it. We are in the days of Noah all day long. It's here. It's here and it's screaming at us. According to Britain's Daily Mail, remember I talked about this earlier? It will allow scientists to take an animal egg, such as a cow or rabbit, remove a genetic material and replace it with human DNA. Days of Noah, chimeras, chimeras. This is what they did in the days of Noah. Ta-da! A hundred years ago, you would never even dream of anything like this. Never even think about it. Well, that's never going to happen. There it is. This is where we are. The hour is incredibly late, in my opinion. As in the days of Noah, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving a marriage. Who? Genesis 6. The sons of God were the ones eating and drinking. The sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, were the ones marrying and giving a marriage. 
and then the flood took them all away. So it will be also the coming of the Son of Man. The question is, is this going on? Stay tuned for tomorrow. <laughs> Second Thessalonians, the coming of a lawless one is according to the work of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Oh, well, just turn the page, L.A., because that's not my best life now. I really don't want to hear that, okay? Just leave me alone. You think what you want, that's fine, but I'm not going there. All signs and lying wonders, what do you think that means? It's not, hey, rock, pull a rabbit out of my head. All signs. Why would Jesus warn us of this, that even the elect would be deceived if that were possible? Why, why would he say that to us? Why would Paul tell us, admonish us, that the coming of a lawless one, the Antichrist, all power, signs and lying wonders, something is coming, something is now slowly being revealed in ways that I never thought I would see, but I'm seeing it now, and it's blowing my mind. It's blowing my mind. Just this week, just, just this week, in the halls of Congress, our, our, elected, our, elected, our elected officials got together and they're talking about, oh my God, the threat, this is unbelievable, blah, 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 blah. Those of us in the field, this is nothing new. You guys are just, you're just full of it. And I'm going to show you, this might be the best UFO footage ever seen. I'll show you what the best UFO footage ever seen is in just a minute. I believe the fallen one has been trying to manipulate the genome in order to create man in his own image. Absolutely. Genesis 3.15, I'm declaring war between you, the woman, your offspring, and hers. Once we understand that, when we get to this, which is where we're going to go tomorrow, this is the best UFO footage. 2009, Lake Kumbergaz, Turkey. That's a UFO. Those two entities are the grays in it. Look at the heat signature. So Dr. Roger Lear is on the shores of Combergas. The reason why he's there, because in 2007 and 2008, a UFO appeared in the same place over Lake Combergas. So Lear goes, he hires a cameraman, they go out there, and they film this thing for hours, for hours. got a telephoto lens on the camera and you see the entities right there we we've blown this up they're grays they're the ones with the big black eyes and the big heads they're grays the worker bees you can see the heat signature I'm gonna run this forward a little bit oh that's a great shot right there that's a great shot this is Kumbergaz Turkey 2009. We had this in our watchers film in 2010. I think it, we, I mean, this is, for us, it's old hat. We've, I've been waving my arms for decades. It's coming, it's coming. <laughs> no one believes it, but now things are changing. Now people start to believe it. When I show this at conferences, now you've seen it, you're responsible for it. So you can see when he zooms in, it's tricky. He's got a telephoto lens and this thing is up by the moon and it's turning. Now this, you know, this is horrible. But then he gets zoned in, and now you get another shot of the ship. Steady. This is the one I think I want. That's the daytime shot. But the one I want to show you is this one. And then we'll move on right, right there. So here's the moon. Watch what happens. There's the moon. And there's the craft right there. There's the moon. There's the craft. Now he zooms in. And you notice that other parts of the craft have opened. And look at the time. There it is again. There's the moon. And then he zooms in. Mm -hmm. 
Anyway, so I whetted your appetite for tomorrow. So that's the best, I think, the best UFO footage because it shows the craft, it shows the occupants of the craft. And it's not some little, it's there for hours. They're here, they are not extraterrestrials, they're not from other planets, they're interdimensional entities.